Good to see you all here this morning. If you have your Bibles, open up to Isaiah chapter 8. And you, you want to do that because we're going to work through Isaiah 8 into chapter 9 as well. I'm, I'm very happy to see that, that Kevin, or Mookie as I call him, is, is doing all right health-wise. I was concerned there for a while that he was going to have a stroke because of this a new technology and, and getting everything together. We have a defibrillator, so we're good on that, but if you have a stroke, I don't know. Buddy. The problem is I got in a hurry, and there's a sermon there for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, you made it work, and we're proud, proud of it. And appreciate your good song leading ability. Isaiah chapter 8, please turn there and we'll start with verse 9. Bad things happen, hard times hit. Sin oftentimes is the cause and Christ is the hope and the cure. In Isaiah's day, Judah, the southern kingdom, a little bitty kingdom, probably about the size of a couple of counties put together, is surrounded by... Israel on the north and Syria a little bit further north and you can throw in Jew, uh, Egypt down below. And those three countries have kind of ganged up on Judah. A little bitty country. And what they want to do is they want to beat up those three countries which were all bigger than, than Judah. But they want to combine forces, beat up on Judah and, and force Judah to help them fight against an even bigger enemy. One of the most ruthless and bloodthirsty empires to ever walk across the earth, the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire is gaining in strength, and it's just sitting up there waiting to swoop down and to, to wipe out all of these little countries. So what does Judah do? Do they... Should they trust in Assyria? Should they fight against their neighbors of Israel and Syria and Egypt? Or should they do what Isaiah says, and that is trust in God and just wait and watch Him work? Too often times people are not satisfied with trusting God. And the king of Judah, he... He decides that he's going to work against Syria and Israel and Egypt and, and, and kind of work with Assyria, which was a mistake in anybody's book. So here are people faced with this war on every front. And what is it that they should do? Well... They should have done what God's people of all time should do, and that's trust Him. You know, there is a foundational truth to be practiced by all of God's people. It's pretty simple. We are to trust God no matter what happens. And by the way, if we trust God, usually the best happens. Now, there are times when that's not exactly the way it works out. Uh, the book of Habakkuk, one of, one of my favorite little books to summarize. <clears throat> Habakkuk is looking at the people of Judah. And they, they are far from where they ought to be. And he says to God, God, do you see the violence and corruption that's going on among your people? And God says, yes, I do, and I'm going to act. I'm going to bring the Babylonians down to punish my people. And Habakkuk says, that's not exactly what I had in mind, Lord. God says, but that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring the Babylonians sweeping down upon Judah. This is 200, 150, 200 years later. I'm going to bring Babylonians sweep, uh, sweeping down on Judah. They're going to punish all this violence and corruption that you're guilty of. And Habakkuk says to God, 
but God, they're worse than we are. And God says, I'm paraphrasing, of course. That's right. And when they get through punishing you, I will punish them. That's a long way from where Habakkuk thought things ought to be. Because he thought, well, God, you ought to step in and you ought to straighten out your people. And, and he had it figured out how God ought to straighten them out. And when God answers, it's not the way Habakkuk thought. But that's the way life works sometimes, isn't it? That we don't always get what we want. And we don't always need what we want. And life isn't always fair. Now we, we have a way we, we can react to that when we, when we don't get what we want. We don't get our way. We can pout. And we can sulk. And we can cry not fair. Or we can trust God and get on with life. Habakkuk didn't hear what he wanted to hear. But at the end of this book he says, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength, he makes my feet like the deer's, he makes me tread on high. The boxes don't understand all this, but here's what I'm going to do. No matter how bad it gets, you're going to trust God. You know what? God must truly be disappointed in us. You know, sometimes we're real good at outward religious acts. And they're important. I mean, uh, they are important. I'm not minimizing them. But God doesn't just look at outward acts. He looks at the human heart. And if He looks at the human heart, He looks at you and I, and He doesn't see trust in our hearts, He must truly be disappointed because that's what He wants from us. I love what the psalmist says in Psalms 20. I think it's verse 7. Some trust in horses and chariots, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. So here's what's happening. Judah surrounded by all of their enemies. What do they do? Well, whoever's speaking in chapter 8, verse 9, he says, Be broken, you peoples, and be shattered. Give ears, all you far countries. Listen, everybody. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Says it twice. In case you missed it the first time, Go ahead and get everything ready. You're going to be defeated. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak a word, but it will not stand. For God is with us. If you're looking at your Bibles, some may not translate it. Some may just see have the word Emmanuel. Well, that's, that's right. But it, Emmanuel means God with us. He's used that word in... Uh, the last of verse 8, he's used it in 7.14. He, whoever's speaking here, he says, Okay, everybody, wage all the war that you want. Make all the plans that you can. But you'll not defeat us because God is with us. That's trust, isn't it? it reminds me of that passage in Psalms 2. Some of those passages are, you know, in our in our day and age of I, well, I don't even know how to describe our day and age in, in the way I want, but some people are almost embarrassed by passages like this. But this is, this is reality here, folks. Reality is God says in Psalms 2 that the nations rage and they wage war against the Lord's anointing. But God sits in heaven looking at that and He laughs at them in derision. It's ridiculous to think that a puny army of human beings can ever fight against God and win. They can't. Ultimately, God's will is done. And ultimately, God takes care of His people. And ultimately, God wins. So, 
Whoever speaking here is saying to the nations, do your worst. We know who wins. And it's God and His people. And what happens next, if you please, Anna, please, please follow along. Chapter 8, verse 11. He's going to tell us that, that we need to do something that is also a foundational truth about Christianity, about Judaism. And that is, we are to be different from the world around us. We're not to be conformed, to quote or to paraphrase Romans 12, 2. We're not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed. We're not to let the world shape us. Years ago when I was at International Bible College, there was a young man, uh, he, was, he was a new Christian, but he had already decided that he was going to be a preacher, and so he had enrolled in Bible College, and, and, and he's all excited. One day I'm at the bookstore, at the bookstore, and I'm in there, and he comes in, he just, oh, he's so excited. He says, I've got it, I've got it. I found out how to, how to get the church fired up and, and, to, and to be what it's supposed to be. I said, I'm ready to hear that. So he goes and he gets a Bible off the shelf and he flips over. I mean, this was new to him. He, he flips over to Romans 12 and he says, Here it is, that you present your bodies as living sacrifice and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. He said, This is it. And we just tell the church this. And I didn't have the heart to tell him that the church had had that passage for 2,000 years. But it's a hard sell apparently for us to understand that we're to be different or it's very hard for us to do. We let so much around us shape us. You know, I, 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 I feel sorry for for young people who who have such pitiful examples to look up to. I, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean-spirited here. I, I mean, there, there's good, but you know, a lot of times, apparently, when we're young, we're attracted to the, the glamorous and the glitter. Uh, I just, you know, you're, you're, you're pitiful if you're Heroes of the Kardashians. That's just pitiful. Or some rapper. That I, I mean, I just it's, it's sad. And we look at that and we say, well, they'll grow out of that. But the truth of the matter is, is we adults sometimes don't do much better because we end up being too much like the world around us in the negative sense. We let the world shape the way we think. We let the world affect our mood. We let the world dictate to us how we feel and what we think we have to have and all of that. And here, the Bible has told us all along that we're to be different. In fact, there's a passage that's in the Old Testament that's quoted in the New. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. And I shall be your God and you shall be my people. But one of the things that, that shapes us, and we get caught up in the world, is we buy into the world's narrative. Well, I'll show you what I'm talking about here. He says, verse 12, Do not call conspiracy all that the people call conspiracy, and do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. Don't, don't think like they think, and buy into what they buy into. I'm embarrassed to say that too often times it is Christian people that buy into some of the nonsense that goes on in the world in the realm of conspiracies. You know, it hadn't been that long ago that the Soviet Union was the Antichrist and that communism was the symbol of evil and communism was going to take the world over. And a lot of times it was Christian people that jumped on the bandwagon and lived in fear and thought that, that the Russians were coming. The Russians were coming. And then the Soviet Union fell apart, so we had to rethink that. And, and, and there's, there's more than that. I'm, I'm just getting some highlights or lowlights, whatever you want to call them. 
But, you know, it was religious people, people that claimed to be people of faith that got all bent out of shape, not, not all exclusively, but a lot of people got bent out of shape over Y2K. Y2K. Oh, boy, the world is going to end, so what the Christians ought to do is they ought to stockpile ammunition and stockpile food and buy a farm because we're all going to have to live off the land and it was going to be every man and woman for themselves. And I know people that had, I mean, had PhDs. Sold everything they had, sold their property, sold their stocks, sold their bonds, got everything, got all their money, went out and lived in the country, ready for Y2K to shut the computers down and change the world. I know religious people that bought land in Macon County, Tennessee, never farmed a day in their life, didn't know how to milk a cow, didn't know anything. Bought them land, getting ready for Y2K. We ought to be wiser than the people of this world, not buy into this nonsense. Conspiracies, conspiracies. I ran into a Baptist preacher down in South Carolina. He, he's a He's a missionary to the Muslim world. And I thought, well, here's a chance for me to get some ideas on how to talk to Muslims about Jesus. And I said, well, tell me what you know. He said, here's what I know. Obama's going to uh, proclaim martial law, and then he's going to institute Sharia law in the United States of America. And I've heard of other people that's grown across America. That's, that's the biggest bunch of nonsense. Nobody in America is going to put up with that. Our military wouldn't put up with that. We're buying these conspiracies. Oh, wow, we got to get worked up. we got to be fearful. Well, you know what Isaiah says? He says, if you want to fear something, fear God. This is verse 13. But the Lord of hosts, Him you shall honor as holy. Let Him be your fear, and let Him be your dread. You want to be afraid of something? Fear God. Now watch what happens when you do that. And he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stone. You fear God. He's going to be your place of safety. You're afraid? You don't need to be afraid of anything if God is your Savior. If He's the one that you're serving, you don't have to be afraid of anything else. He's got you. And he goes on and says some other things, and you'll notice as you read on that a lot of these quotes are found in the New, or these statements are found in the New Testament. But he says, not only should you trust God and not be conformed to this world, but you ought to go to the most reliable source of information there is. He says this in uh, verse 19. And when they say to you, inquire of the medium and the necromancers who chirp and mutter. In other words, here are people, sensible people, that are going to fortune tellers and having seances and trying to draw somebody up from the dead to get some information. And <laughs> I just. And apparently, these people, when they. When they talked, you know, apparently they were speaking for the dead. Apparently, it had to be a strange voice that sounded something like birds chirping. And so he's kind of making fun of them there. I, I never will forget. Uh, I was just, I'm shocked at some, how gullible some people are. In Jackson Square in New Orleans, you walk around there, and there's all these fortune tellers and all this stuff. And I never will forget one of them had a sign hanging on their table. Christian fortune teller. Now, if you know anything at all about the Bible, there is no such thing as a Christian fortune teller because fortune tellers go against everything there is in the Bible. <laughs> of 
Christian fortune tell. Yeah, God wants you to go and give some strange looking person your money so they can flip over a card and tell you what God has. Ridiculous. And there are people that get up all the time and read their horoscope. Some of you do it for fun. I know I'm not talking about you, but I don't know why you do that. But they get up and they read their horoscope and they try to determine what's going to happen by the horoscope. And then there's people that go to fortune tellers and there's people that have seances and trying to find out. And here's what Isaiah says. Are you listening to this? <clears throat> Isaiah says... Should they not inquire, or should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living to the teaching and to the testimony? If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no doubt. He says, get in the Bible. That's what he says. You want to know how to make good decisions? Get in the book. Instead of talking to dead people, why don't you talk to the living God? Instead of listening to some fortune teller, listen to the one who made everything. <laughs> he says, if they will not speak according to this word, it's because they have no dawn. He says, if people that are telling you what's what, and they're not basing it on the scripture, and by the way, some base some of these conspiracies on scripture, so... If they're handling the scripture right, then they're going to tell you the right thing. Go to the scripture. But listen, I, I don't want to be too... I don't want my opinion to come across too strongly, but, you know, we used to fuss about uh, watching TV too much and neglecting the Bible, and that's still needed. It's still needed... Because here's what we're doing. We're watching TV or we're, we're doing so many things now. TV is TV's now probably second on the list behind young people playing games or staring at their phones. And all of this stuff is going on. And meanwhile, the book that has life's plans for us is lying neglected. That's sad, folks. It's sad. And you say, well, I read my Bible on your phone. Probably not as much as you spend looking at Twitter or Facebook or listening to music, all of which are giving you messages probably that are contrary to what God wants for you. I'm not saying there's not some good out there. There, there is good. But to the law and to the testimony, get back in the book. So he says that we ought to trust God. We ought to be different from the world. And we ought to look to the law and the testimony, the scripture. And fourthly, we ought to remember that God's answer to evil as a child. All the terrible, horrible dictators that walked across the earth. All the evil that has been done. You know, I, I love history. I don't understand people not liking it a little bit. Because I can understand not liking dates. That's that's you know, that's kind of hard to get your mind around and be excited about the fact that you can remember dates. But history is our story. And it's raw human emotions and it's it's battles between good and evil and it's it's it's, it's life. And you go back and you think about all those people that have suffered at the hands of tyrants and dictators and megalomaniacs and all of that. And you and you see more coming on the scene. It's easy to be fearful. But God's answer to all the evil is, is, is a child. 
And before that child, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. And all who have exalted themselves, He will humble. And all those who have humbled themselves to Him will be exalted. So the Bible says in Isaiah 9 and verse 6, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor. You want good advice? I can tell you who gives the best. Everybody needs direction. Everybody needs a little clear understanding. Well, then listen to the great counselor. Mighty God. Man. Have you... You're not going to see this on Scottsville Road. In fact, that kind of stuff kind of makes you lose your religion, doesn't it? When you when you get in that traffic on Scottsville Road. My advice to you, it'll, it'll help y'all, is, is to get out away from all of that. Go out in the country somewhere on one of these clear nights. And look at the stars in heaven. And, and, and lately it's been so clear and it's been shooting stars just right and left. And it's just something to behold. And just, just focus on that a little while. And think. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. We, we serve a mighty God who created all things. And if He's on our side and we're on His, why would we be filled with fear? Everlasting Father. Do y'all know how many people in this country don't even know who their father is or don't really know their father? It's pathetic, folks. It's pathetic. Look at the crime rate in this country and it's skyrocketing and we wonder why. It's pretty easy to know why. We've allowed homes to explode and implode and made marriage not important and we have children growing up without two parents that love them, without somebody in their life to discipline them, without a father figure and and. So many people, you even mentioned Father, they have bad images because if they knew who he was, he may be a bad guy. But folks, we have the everlasting Father that will not desert us. Who's proud to claim us. And who will never leave us or forsake us. He's the Prince of Peace. If you go back up to verse 5, he talks about all the army gear, all the stuff that's been used to be burned as fire, fuel for the fire. Folks, he is the ultimate Prince of Peace. And that's what he wants to bring to my life and to your life. And that's what ultimately he will bring to all those who follow him is everlasting, eternal, can't take it away from us, peace. So what should we do in times of difficulty, times of chaos, when things don't go our way, we ought to trust God, we ought not become like the world, we ought to get in the book, and we ought to look forward to the Lord's Son coming back and claiming His own. May be that someone needs to respond to the invitation today to become a Christian, or you may be a Christian that's fallen away need to be restored. We invite you to come whatever your need is as we stand and sing together. On the end